Luke 12 is where we're going to be this morning. Luke 12. I've got to say, I'm excited to get back in the pulpit. It's been about seven weeks since I've been up here. Um, and um, you'll have to make up your own mind whether that shows up in the sermon today or not. But, um, man, a couple of things. I mean, there's just a lot of things to celebrate about over the last... Um, several weeks of what God's been doing. We've seen baptisms. We've seen baby dedications. We've seen a phenomenal group of um, men and women preach from the Word through the preaching cohort. And God has just been really, really gracious and good. And the last several weeks with the cohort, we have been incredibly blessed by the sermons that we've heard. And I'm not going to lie, every single one of them preached as if they were interviewing for my job. And so... It's time for me to get back up here and remind them who's the pastor here, right? And so, um, but they were just really, really good. And so this morning we're going to be in Luke 12. And we're going to look at one more parable as we close out this series on the parables of Jesus. Luke 12, we're going to be in 13 to 34. But let me set up the sermon this way. Um, one of the legends of music um, when I was growing up was a man who for a season was named Prince, and then he became a symbol, and then he went back to Prince. Um, and he was just a phenomenal musician. He was an interesting character. Um, Prince is one of those guys that could rock high heel boots, wear a blouse with lace, wear a perm, and still be the manliest man in the building, right? Um, and with those high heel boots, he could jump and do a split and play the guitar, and he was a phenomenal performer to watch. He was a musical genius. Prince had this unique ability to make you think about life through music. And that's what a good artist does. They make you think, think about things that cause you to, they write or create things that cause you to reflect and ponder on the words or the art that they create. Consider these words from, the opening words from one of his famous songs, Let's Go Crazy. Dearly beloved, We've gathered here today to get through this thing called life. Electric word, life, it means forever. And that's a mighty long time. But I'm here to tell you there's something else. The afterworld. That's, that's not a bad start to a popular song. Forget the flamboyant outfits and the stunning guitar riffs. Prince was like everyone else in this world trying to get through this thing we call life. In a very real sense, that's what our text is about this morning. The section begins with Jesus being asked a question. A man makes this request of Jesus, but the Lord's answer to him reveals a deeper issue, a deeper issue about life itself. And what we learn in our text this morning is how Jesus views life and how we're to view it as well. Look at this passage, Luke 12, 13. I'm going to go all the way down to 34. Someone from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus said to him, Friend, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he then told them, Watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. And then he told him a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do? Since I don't have anywhere else to store my crops, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. And then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many, many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life is demanded of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. And then he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't have a storeroom or a barn, and yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than the birds? Can any one of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? 
If then you're not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of this. Not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass which is in the field today and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you, O you of little faith? Don't strive for what you should eat or what you should drink, and don't be anxious, for the Gentile world eagerly seeks all those things, but your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your Father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, make money bags for yourselves that don't grow old, an inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. You might have noticed as we read through the text this morning that there is this one word that keeps popping up over and over, this word called life. The idea of life is a scarlet thread that runs throughout this text And what I want to do this morning is through this text, just briefly answer the question, what exactly is life? What is life? Verse 13, someone in the crowd, we don't know his name. We don't know much about him. Someone says to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, you guys know this tone, right? Um, If you have a brother, if you have a sibling, you've definitely used this tone. If you're a parent, uh, you've heard your kids do this tone. Daddy, tell my sister. Right? Daddy, tell my brother. Um, You've heard this tone. I probably hear this about one or two times a day in my house. Daddy, tell my sister. Daddy, my sister did this or my brother did this. And here's this guy demanding, insisting that Jesus would do what he requests. To command his brother to split the inheritance If you think about the request, it's an interesting request. I mean, like there's a time and a place for certain types of conversations. And here's this guy standing in the middle of a crowd uh, with a bunch of strangers. And this is probably not the most appropriate place to talk about a family inheritance. We don't know who this guy is. We just know that he's someone in the crowd. We don't even think he's a disciple of Jesus It isn't even clear if this person has a relationship or a friendship with Jesus. But here's this guy saying, Jesus, tell my brother to give me half the inheritance. Think about that for a second. If there's an inheritance to be divided, that means there was a death to be mourned. Yet he doesn't really seem to be concerned about that. He doesn't say, Jesus, help me and my brother to grieve well. He doesn't say, in the aftermath of my loss, help me and my brother to help take care of the rest of the family. Tell my brother, give me my stuff. Give me my inheritance. This is why Jesus says in verse 14, dude, I want nothing to do with that. I'm not messing with that. I'm not getting involved in your petty argument. I don't have time for that. Who appointed me judge, arbitrator over you? And Jesus is clear. He didn't come to get involved in the petty affairs of men. He had a bigger agenda, and that agenda has to do with life and with the state of our heart. And in verse 15 and following, he begins to unfold some lessons about life. And I want you to notice five things from this text, five things about life. Number one, life is not defined by a lot of stuff. Life is not defined by a lot of stuff. Verse 15, he then told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Some of your Bibles will say the word covetousness or greed, but what is that? It's wanting stuff that's not yours. It's one of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. Thou shall not covet, thou shall not want what is not yours. Thou shall not look at anything that doesn't belong to you and desire it for yourself. And out of that heart disease of greed comes all kinds of sins. Think about it. People steal because, more fundamentally, they're greedy, aren't they? They commit adultery because they covet, they desire, they're longing for someone who's not their spouse, someone that does not belong to them. 
And you think about how many scams that are effective because of our sin of greed. How many people get taken by internet scams? You know, you get that email, right, that you are somehow related to some dead king in Africa, and he's left you $16 trillion, and all you need, all they need is your social security and your bank account. You know why you still get that? Because people buy into that. Because it's effective. Because of greed. What about the pyramid schemes? Bernie Madoff, he made millions and people lost their fortunes on a Ponzi scheme. We're greedy. Think about the prosperity gospel. That nonsense is popular because people is greedy. People are greedy. They want the bling. They want the stuff. They want those riches and then they twist scripture to say that it's God's desire for you to be well and healthy and have all this stuff. And so these preachers will say stuff like, hey, sow $50 and watch that God by the end of this week give you 500 And sadly, they know people will give. Why? Because people are greedy. People aren't in it for Jesus and all Jesus has already done it for, for him. People are in it for what Jesus could possibly give them. And so they're greedy. And so Jesus tells us that the nature of life is it does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Do you know there are about 42,000 subways in the world? 42,000. There are about 37,000 McDonald's in the world. There are about 30,000 Starbucks in the world. I thought there would be more Starbucks, actually. Um, but that's pretty impressive. But do you know that in the U.S. alone, there are 52,000 storage units? 52,000 storage units. And you know who owns storage units? People with big homes that don't have space to put their stuff. And so they will pay hundreds of dollars to store their stuff in, into a storage box that they'll never use. And when they die, their kids will come and throw it away. Storage units. People are gagging to death on stuff. And Jesus here tells us that it's because sometimes we begin to think that life is defined by what we have by how much we have, the abundance of it. And so Jesus tells this story. He says this parable about this famous man who has barns full of stuff. And he looks at his barn, and he feels really good about life, and he really feels really good about business, and he really feels really good about his possessions and his business this year, and the cash is just rolling in, and everything is going well. And so he begins to think to himself, and he actually begins to talk to him. He says, self, life is good. Life is going well. Things are great. And so I'm going to tear my old barn down, and I'm going to build a bigger yarn, and I'm going to store all my stuff in there. And he begins to start speaking to himself, and he says, Self, chill, relax, eat, drink, be merry. And he presumes that he's going to do this for a long, long time. And then God speaks, and the first words out of God's mouth is, You fool. You fool. Friends, it's foolish to think that our life will not end. It's foolish to think that our lives are defined by what we have. It's foolish to think that our lives will not end and we will go on and join where all the others have gone. One day, sooner or later than we think, our souls will be required of us. We will be called to give an account to God. And here's the thing, you will not be able to justify life by what you have. You will not be able to say, God, look at all that I possess. Look at all that I own. And if you do, you will probably hear something like this, which is also in Scripture, where God will say to you, what do you have that you did not first get from me? What do we have that God did not give to us? You're not going to impress God with your possessions. God will look at you and be like, brother, please, I gave you that. It's not you're not impressing me. What, I, what you have, I gave you. In fact, it's not even yours. It's mine. I just let you borrow it for a season. The earth is mine and everything in it. You're not that impressive. Friends, it's a real mistake to think that your life is made up of the possessions that you own. It's a mistake to think that your life is going to be defined by the type of car you drive or the type of home that you own or the title um, of your job or the number of letters behind your name on your degree. It's a mistake to think that. And so you get to the line in verse 21, 
He says, this is how it is with the one who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. And we'll come to that phrase, rich towards God, here in a second. But notice, there is a way to be rich toward God. And there's a way to be rich toward yourself and be stingy towards God. And friends, God calls that foolish. Life is not defined by what we own. Number two, life is more than food and clothing. Life is more than food and clothing. Verse 22, and he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and body more than clothing. You see the connection there between verses 22, 23, verse 22 says, don't be anxious about your life, what you eat, what you wear. Verse 23 says, why? Because life is more than food. Life is more than clothing. God says, don't worry about those needs that you have. Why? Because life is more than those things. It's not defined by how much you have. But listen, your life is more valued than what you have. And he gives this illustration in verse 24. Think about the ravens. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't have a storehouse. They don't have a barn. Yet God feeds them. Aren't you of much more worth than these birds? He says, he starts talking about little birds, insignificant birds. He says, consider them. God feeds these little birds, things that we regard as insignificant in and of themselves. They don't work. They don't have barns. They don't have storehouses. And yet God feeds these birds. How much more us? How much more will he provide for us whom he values more highly than ravens? The reason we shouldn't worry is about our needs, and the reason our life is worth more than our needs is because you and I are worth more to God. God cares for us in this way. Our minds should then rest on him, and we should cease to worry about even our needs. See, the question is, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are worth more to God than the ravens? That you are worth more to God to such an extent that God will provide for you? Are, are we so secure in the knowledge of God's goodness toward us and his love toward us that we will cease to worry about our real needs? What will we eat? What will we wear? Friends, it's wrong to think that if we don't have anything, we aren't worth anything. Notice again in verse 24 when God says, Of how much more value are you than the birds? Some of your Bibles might have a question mark there, but the original translation is not a question mark. It's an exclamation. You are of much more value than birds. It's not a rhetorical question. It's a definitive statement. You are worth more to God than the creation that he clothes. And if he clothes the creation, how will he not also clothe you and feed you? Again, the question is, do you believe it? Life is not defined by stuff. And life is valued more than food and clothing. Number three, life is wasted by worry. Life is wasted by worry. Look at verse 25 through 28. There's some of you that might be here saying that, that's great, God cares for me, God cares for my stuff, God will do this, but I still have to pay bills. I still have to eat. I still have to provide for my family. I still have to make sure the lights turn on when I get home from work. How am I going to get through this thing called life? Verse 25. Verse 25. Can any of you add one moment to this lifespan by worrying? If then you're not even able to do a little thing, like that, why worry about the rest? Our world is full of worry, isn't it? And we're tempted to think that worrying is actually thinking. We're tempted to think that worrying is actually planning. We're tempted to think that by our worrying, we're taking control over the situation that's in front of us. But notice what Jesus says, that by your worrying, you can't even add one hour to your life. Jesus is like saying, hey, Adding one hour to your life is nothing to Jesus because he is going to add eternity to your life if you're in him. He's like, you, you can't even add one hour to your life by worrying, so why are you going to worry at all? And he's calling us to recognize that our life is lived in such a way that we're called to trust him, not ourselves. 
We lean not to our own understanding, but we certainly don't lean on our own worry, but we lean and entrust ourselves to God who cares for us. Listen, if you can't even add one hour to your life by worrying, why are you going to stress about your job? Why are you going to go nuts worrying about things that you have no control over? Why are you going to get anxious about things like politics and war and our communities and our families, all things worth praying about but not worrying about? If you're going to worry, don't pray. If you're going to pray, don't worry. And that's what Jesus is calling us to. He's saying that if we live our lives worrying and being anxious, we're going to end up wasting our lives. But if we really want to experience life, we won't worry, but we will trust him who holds our lives in his hands. Look at verse 27. Think about how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor, they don't spin thread, and yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of, this, one of these. He's saying, God dresses flowers better than he dresses kings. Verse 28. If that's how much God clothes the grass which is in the field today and thrown in the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you, you of little faith? See, what he's saying is when it comes to life, God's got you. When it comes to the days that you are on this earth, God's got you. He can supply your needs. Do you need evidence? Look around you. Look at the grass. Look at the fading grass, the flowers, the birds flying around. Does God not provide for all of his creation? He will certainly provide for those who bear his image and his likeness. This is for us. It is for us of little faith to believe. Number four. Life is about seeking God and his kingdom. You know, I love the different million group me messages that we have going around in our church. Um, like every group and every subgroup has a group me um, uh, stuff. And then we have our Facebook group, um, all sorts of communication that's happening. And I constantly see this message that says, hey, I need this, right? It might be, hey, I need someone to help me give me a ride, or I might need someone to... I need just some help around the house or some need. And I, there's this constant need. And there's, sometimes there's these needs. I'm like, oh, man, I have no idea how you're going to get that. You're going to have to figure that out by yourself because there's no way we can meet our needs. And then all of a sudden, I start reading the comments underneath, and it seems like people just jump in and respond and take care of them. Needs met. It's the most wonderful thing, seeing people seeking help and the body rallying around to see those needs met. And that's perhaps a small picture of verses 29 to 31. That when people seek God's kingdom, God meets their needs first. In fact, life is meant to be lived seeking God and his kingdom. And the natural consequence of you seeking God first in his kingdom is that God says he will take care of you and provide for you. There's, notice verse 29. Don't strive for what you should eat or what you should drink or don't be anxious because... The Gentile world eagerly seeks those things, but your father knows that you need them. Pause there for a second. He's saying there's something ungodly, something unchristlike, something pagan about worrying about things like what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear, what we're going to sleep. All the non-following world, all the non-following people in the world give their attention to things like that. They stress about things like that. They worry about things like that. But those things belong to those people who don't belong to Jesus. Those shouldn't be defining of you. Why? Because you have a father who knows what you need. And so you ought to remember that our father knows what we need. And ever since school started, two things happened consistently in my life. My kids will ask for rides or they'll ask for money right? Every single day, I come home and they're like, um, they're waiting at the garage door with their hands outstretched saying, I need money, right? And it's whether it's band money or athletics or school trips or they want to buy lunch, like seriously, fast a day or two. Um, T-shirt money, fundraising money, it's insane, right? And now because I'm a loving father and my wife would kill me, I'll give them money to eat. Um, but there's some things I just say, hey, you don't need it. It's not necessary. I think God is like that to an extent, but he's even better. See, when I'm walking in my garage door, I have no idea what the next request is going to be. 
I just know there's a request coming because they're standing at the garage door, right? But before we even come to God, he knows what we need. Before we show up, he already knows what we need. Oftentimes with my kids, I don't know what the need is till it's a permission form that's put in my face with, hey, this is how much I need to give for this trip or this activity. But God isn't sitting there waiting to find out what we need. Our Father knows what we need even before we ask. The reason the kids have to come and ask me is because I wasn't there when the need arose in the first place. They found out, they came home with this form, they make the request, but it's not like that with God. He is there every step of the way with you. He knows your needs before you even knew him, long before we ask, long before we pray, long before we even know what our needs are. Our Father in heaven sees, friends, and he knows. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's never caught off by our needs. And there is no need that we have that he cannot supply. And he gives us this promise that if we would seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, he will supply all of our needs. Listen to these words from David in the Psalms. He says, I've been young and now I'm old. But the one thing I have never seen in my life is that the children of God being abandoned or their children begging for food. Friends, God knows you if you seek first his kingdom. He will take care of you. That's what our Father is like. Our children will never beg for bread, and He will have this constant, up-to-date, even before time knowledge of our needs. And friends, His promise is that He will supply it. Life is not defined by what we have. Life is not defined by... Life is more than our food and our clothes. Life is wasted by our worrying. Life is given to us to seek God and His kingdom. Last thing, life follows treasure. Life follows treasure. What an encouragement verse 32 is. See, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is not like this Easter egg hunt. You don't search for it wondering if you'll ever find it. It's not hidden so that you will miss it. It's your Father's good pleasure, His delight to give you the kingdom. Verse 32, don't be afraid, little flock, because your Father delights to give you the kingdom. It delights for him to bless his children. It delights to give to us who are seeking him all that is his royal possession. He's not grudging about it. He's not resentful about it. He doesn't have to make any apologies about as if we're depleting his resources or savings account. He delights to give. God takes pleasure over our lives, in our lives, as he gives to us his kingdom that we are seeking. What a wonderful encouragement that is to us. Friends, that if you ask anything of God in his kingdom, if you ask anything according to his will, he hears you and you have your request. He says, ask anything of me. What a wonderful promise. What a blank check. Ask anything of me and I, and you have your request. As I was studying this, I was just reminded of how weak and how uninspiring my prayers are that I don't have the courage to ask my Father for bigger, for better, for greater, for His glory. Here's a Father who owns the kingdom, who delights it to give to you and I. He says, come get it. The question is, where's our heart? Look at verse 33. Jesus goes on to apply this, and he says, sell your possessions. Give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old and exhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes or moth destroys. See, we can use our lives and all that we possess to be a blessing because we know that the Father gives us a kingdom and a treasure that cannot be taken away, that cannot be stolen, and it cannot be rusted. The biggest thing you want on this earth, whether it's a home or a car or the most expensive thing you want, Eventually, you'll have to replace it. It'll get destroyed. It'll wear out. It'll have issues. So God says, your heart should be for my kingdom. I'll take care of your other needs. Show me a person who can't give to others, and I'll show you a person who doesn't believe the Father 
gives to him or her. Show me a person who cannot part with their own things, and I'll show you a person who doesn't believe that the treasures of heaven are better than anything that this world has to offer. It's really that simple. Our life follows our treasure. Verse 34, let me close here. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart is. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. Friends, the key to life is to have treasures in heaven, to be rich towards God. Life is not meant to live for ourselves and what we gain on this fading round ball that we call earth. Life, friends, is meant to be lived for God and what we will gain in his kingdom. That's why we've been given life to know him, to enjoy him, to seek him, to delight in him, to know his goodness, to know his love, to know his grace. I think Prince had it right. We're gathered here today to get through this thing called life. Electric word, life, it means forever. And that's a mighty long time. But I'm here to tell you there's something else. Friends, as followers of Jesus, there is something else. It's called the kingdom of God. It's called living your life in such a way you will hear the, you were, you will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter your reward. That's something else for you and I have been, that's, there's something else that you and I have been created for to find and enter into what God is calling us to be, whose king into the kingdom of God, whose king is also our loving father who says, I will supply your needs. The question is, how do you do that? Prince doesn't have the answer in his songs, but God tells us in his word. You enter the kingdom by confessing your sins, turning away from your own Self, selfish pursuits that ultimately leave you disappointed and you put your faith in your life in Jesus who never fails you, never disappoints you, always takes care of you. See, God's giving to us begins with the giving of his son. He sent his, world into the, he sent his son into the world so that we would not be condemned, that we would not be judged eternally to hell for our sins. He sent his son into the world to take our place to wear human likeness, to obey God perfectly so you and I would have the perfect righteousness of God. To die on the cross that was really made for you and I, a cross that you and I should have been hung on, where we should have paid the penalty for our own sins, but instead Jesus says, I will take your place. He bears our penalty. He suffers God's judgment. He is crushed for our sins. He's buried for three days, and then God raises him from the dead, proving that he is Lord of death, and he's Lord of our lives. He is the giver of life. He raises his son so that everyone who has faith in Jesus in the same way will be raised from death to life in Jesus, and we will live forever in Jesus in his kingdom where God has purchased by the blood of Jesus. Friends, life means forever. And that's a mighty long time. And it's either lived with God as your father in his love, or it's lived against God, suffering his judgment. God sets before us today life or death, blessing or cursing. Choose life. Choose life. The life that God gives, he gives to all that trust in him. Maybe you're here this morning and you want to know about more about what that means and how to enter that life, we would love nothing more than to help you think through this. As soon as I'm done here, there's going to be two individuals back there to pray with you. If you want to know more about Jesus, can I invite you, before you leave here, talk to one of them. Help, them pro help you process through what life is about. Maybe you're here this morning and you've said, I surrendered my life to Jesus, but you really haven't surrendered anything else to Jesus. You're still holding on to your dreams, your pursuits, your careers. You've never stopped to say, Jesus, what do you want from me? What do you desire from me? Before you come to the table this morning, can I ask you, beg you, plead of you, say, take a moment and ask Jesus, Jesus, what are you calling of me? Is my dreams about how rich I could be, how successful I can be, or is my dream to say, God, at the end of my life, I want to hear, well done. 
I want to live my life in such a way that you are honored and glorified. Would you pause? Would you reflect? Would you ask Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That he has redeemed you, saved you, rescued you, and he's called you to something greater. He's called you to life eternal, and he calls you to kingdom living now. So can I invite you to jump, jump in? Can I invite you to get engaged, get involved, pursue Jesus, live life, live it to the fullest? We're about to sing a song that says, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. You have been blessed because even though your sins were many, his mercy was more. As we come to the table, we come recognizing that because of what that table represents, because of our sins, someone had to die, take our place, so that even though our sins were many, his mercy is more. And because we have received his mercy, we're called to live life for his glory. So can I invite you this morning, take a moment, examine your heart, your life. The way we do communion here at Loft, the worship team's about to sing. I'm going to invite you to just reflect for a second, and whenever you're ready, come down the middle aisles, grab the elements, go back to your seats. But take some time to reflect. Take some time to pray. If you want someone to pray with you again, there's folks in the back ready to pray with you. But whenever you're ready this morning, let's celebrate the table. Let's celebrate the finished work of Jesus. Let's worship.